All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Mike and New Haven podcast. This is episode 101. If you haven't checked out episode 100, that was my milestone episode. We had to go big for it, and we did. I spoke with John Miller, NYPD Deputy Commissioner, of course, and a veteran journalist who in the 1980s had notable interactions while working as a reporter for NBC with the likes of Dennis Mulvasey and John Gotti, and of course, most notoriously as a member of the ABC News team in 1998, traveled to the compound of and subsequently interviewed Osama bin Laden being the last Westerner and only American to speak with Mr. Bin Laden at his compound in, I believe, Afghanistan in May of 1998. And of course, he discusses his current work with the NYPD. It was great. John was really cool to talk to, and I'm glad I got him on. This episode, 101, features the continuation of a miniseries called The E-Men Inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit. And if you liken being an E-Man in the NYPD to cooking a steak, then my next guest will be considered well done. A 21-year veteran of the NYPD spent 15 of those years doing just about everything underneath the sun as a member of the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit, joining the force in 1981. His 1987 arrival at ESU kickstarted a journey that saw him serve in the eye of the storm of everything that New York City had to throw his way. Joining us for volume two of the miniseries, The E-Men, inside the NYPD's emergency service unit, is retired NYPD detective Ken Winkler. Ken, welcome. How are you? Thank you, sir. Doing well. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So first question is an easy one. Where'd you grow up and describe what those early years were like? I grew up in Brooklyn, Sunset Park. I was one of seven, the oldest of seven. Um, middle-class neighborhood, everybody had very large families back then, um, went to school in Brooklyn, grammar school, high school, uh, attended college, attended St. John's, attended Kingsborough Community College, and came on a police department in 1981. So when did the interest in the idea of civil service uh, start, and did you always want to be specifically a police officer, or were you one of those guys that took the FD and the PD test and waited to see which one would call you first? No, I mean, actually, I was going to school. Um, I was majoring in business. I was in a motorcycle accident, so I had to take a semester off. I started working security at Luther Medical Center. And my boss at the time was a retired first grader, had been in a lot of a lot of high profile cases, did a lot of work on the, the BLA cases. So it kind of sparked my interest a little bit. I took the job, took the, came on as a transit cop. For, I actually was called in 1979, but I was, was three days prior to my 20th birthday. So they deferred me to the next class and there was some legal challenges that went on. I was called for transit, took transit, and then switched over to NYPD in January of 83. So transit, you ride, we hide. You're working underground. Uh, of oh, course, yeah. you know, it's it's a different environment. Uh, you're, the subways feature just about everything that there can be because you're, you know, it's, it's basically the crossroads of communica- uh, communication, of travel, I should say, not communication. I don't know where my head's at. But, um, you know, everyone's coming into the city as a tourist. Of course, you have people trying to get to work. And then, of course, you have people that are just wandering around for whatever reason. So working underneath, tra- you know, this, uh, the ground of New York City in these subways, of course, and carrying around those radios that so often did not work. Take me what through that taught you about being a cop. Well, when I, when I came on the job, you know, it was a different city. It was a different city. We graduated the police academy um, March of 1982. I think we graduated a day or two before St. Patrick's Day. The city was different. Um, subways were different. Crime was different. I started out in District 1 in Manhattan. I wanted to always be someplace where it was busy. And District 1 was a busy place, but it was also in Manhattan. We worked, the new guys kind of worked the shift called the 8Ps. We worked from 8 at night to 4.30 in the morning riding trains from one end of the line to the other. You were by yourself. Um, the radios worked, the radios didn't work. So, I mean, you, you learn quickly. I think we spent about a week or two with a training officer. And then we just, you know, kind of set off on our own. It was a good job. Um, but my my desire was always to be on the NYPD. It, the, the NYPD, this was pre-merge, of course. The NYPD offered more opportunities. So my intent was to switch over once I was called. And so 1983, you joined the NYPD, mm-hmm. uh, of course. Uh, and you do switch over and you do have that opportunity for career advancement. Um, you know, it's often been said, I had this conversation with uh, my friends Hank Molay and, and our mutual friend Dan McNally from the Bomb Squad that, you know, I asked them when you got to your respective occupations, uh, Hank being a fireman and Dan, of course, being a cop for the Bomb Squad, um, 
you know, previously these guys had backgrounds in those respective fields. So when you're coming on to the NYPD, you're not a rookie. You have a little bit of experience under your belt. Not a lot, but still some experience that's, that's valuable. Did the guys like that about you or did they feel that they needed to retrain you about everything in regards to how it correlated to the NYPD as opposed to transit? Well, we, well when we switched over, we had to do about a month in the academy. And it was more just to learn some of the uh, different nuances of the job, the differences between the two jobs. Back then, there was the transit police, housing police, and the NYPD, or the three separate agencies. So you did about a um, month in the police academy, and then you went to an NSU, a neighborhood stabilization unit. The NSU that I went to was in Manhattan, it turned out the 13th precinct. So again, um, Manhattan was you know, the place I wanted to work. And we covered the 13th precinct, the 9th precinct, uh, 10th precinct, and the 6th precinct, the division two. So it was a fun place, right? You had, you had your mix of everything within those four precincts. The one I enjoyed the most was the ninth precinct. You know, ninth precinct, Lower East Side, was a busy place. It was a it was an exciting place to work. It was a small precinct that um, had a lot of crime, a lot of action. Uh, they were close precinct. I knew some folks that had worked there. So my goal was to go to the ninth precinct, and fortunately, I did. Who would you credit uh, on the NYPD side of things with really showing you lessons of the job that would later help you as you advance in your career? And of course, would eventually, I imagine, train other officers coming on the job. Well, when we were in NSU, we worked with training officers. You know, these were these are old timers, these are detectives, they were field training officers. And, you know, I had the opportunity to work with uh, field training officers that worked in the 9th precinct in the 70s. You know, they were there doing Forster and Laurie who were killed. We worked through those very, very difficult times. You know, they were my training officers. So you learned a lot from them. Um, and I'm still friends with some of them. So it's been a long time, but there's a, there's a connection. There's a ninth precinct connection. Our ninth precinct still runs a Toys for Tots event every year. The um, guys still get together. So the connection, I always say that, you know, there's a connection with people who live in Brooklyn in general, and there's a connection with people who are, at some point in their career had worked in the ninth precinct. Um, when you walk in there, you see all the plaques of the officers that have, you know, died in the line of duty behind the desk. And you, know, you, you kind of takes you back a little bit. You understand what they went through. The precinct is certainly different than it was when I was there. But I'm sure when I got there, it was different than it was 10 years or 20 years before me. So you, you learn from everybody. There's not one single person you can't learn something from. You know, when I was on transit, I learned from everybody. You learn simple things like you know, if you're carrying keys, put a rubber band on your keys so they don't make a lot of noise. If you're walking up a flight of stairs, take your hat off because if the bad guys are at the top of the staircase, the first thing they're going to see is your hat. You know, and, and sometimes seconds make the difference. You know, and th these are the things you learn. You learn how to sit in a radio car. You learn how to blade yourself. You know, how to access your weapon if you had to from being in a, in a car. You know, these, these came from people that were, you know, shot at while they were on patrol. We learn these things, and and then you pass these things on to other offices that are that you that you train. And when closer, I guess through the Mike Newton podcast for episode one hundred and one. This is volume two of the E Men inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit. So for a while, you were an undercover narcotics officer. Now that is high high uh, octane kind of work. It's very dangerous. You really have to think on your feet. Uh, take me through a year of being a, a narc in a time in which drugs were the craze in New York City, particularly crack. So there was an opportunity when I was in the precinct to apply for what they call the 90-day temporary transfer to the narcotics division as an undercover officer. I applied for it, I accepted to it, and um, I was subsequently renewed three times. So I did a year. So the first three months that I worked, I worked in Brooklyn North Narcotics. You know, limited places where, you know, a uh, blonde-haired white kid from you know, the city can buy drugs in certain parts of the city. It's just, this is the fact. But there are other areas that we would tra traverse, particularly if you were going to Long Island, 
uh, where you could get off the Bell Parkway and stop somewhere and pick up some drugs. And you would dress, whether you're dressing as a construction worker or, or something else. And that's what you, that's where you would think you, how you'd make your purchases. You would get what they call kites, which were complaint reports. And you go out with your team and you have buy money and you would go make a, a buy and your team would be somewhere in the area. Um, and then they would affect the arrest. When I became, when I started working on the cover in Queens, it was a little bit different. There was a more opportunity for somebody like myself to, to make buys. And I had the opportunity to get into some more involved cases. And I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I kind of thought that was going to be my career. And it was actually, you know, it was the, it was the Miami Vice days, right? <laughs> You know, that's really what it was. You were walking on a set, you know, you were, you, you were the king, right? Um, and it was actually pre-crack. We didn't want to buy crack. We wanted to buy weight. Our goal was to buy weight. Our goal was to get warrants, to develop cases. And crack was more of an annoyance than anything else. It was easy to get beaten with crack. They would put ivory soap into the, uh, you know, into the vials. And, you know, it wasn't the weight that we really wanted. But then crack explored Right, you know, um, I had a friend of mine, um, Chris Oban, who I grew up with, a little younger than I was, who was assassinated. He was assassinated up in Harlem. Uh, that night, there was another officer, a uniform officer, Officer Yusuf, who was also killed that night. One of the few nights when two New York City police officers were killed in, in separate incidents. But I knew Chris, he was an undercover. You know, when you're walking in, you know, they're, they're going to show their guns and, you know, you may have your gun, you may not have your gun. But it was just, I enjoyed it. You know, I, my, I expected to be there for my career. But things, so, you know, things didn't pan out that way. Yeah, uh, you, your road took a little bit of a turn. And for my listeners, you're referencing, of course, uh, the night, and I believe October of 1988, when, when Hogan and Busick were shot and killed in separate incidents. Uh, but in, out of tragedy has been born great efforts. I think there's a softball league in both officers' memories that helps yes. a lot of children. So uh, out of a situation as horrible as that one, at least some good has come out of it. It's, you know, you always try to look for the silver linings in these things. So that brings us to 1987, when you join the emergency service unit. It's a unit with a very rich history. I explain this for my listeners. If you go back and listen to my episode for volume one of this mini series with Sergeant John Lampkin, uh, ESU's origins can be traced back to the Fiorello LaGuardia days. Uh, he added some sort of dispute with the fire department. I'm not knocking the fire department. I like them a lot too. And I have had uh, you know, a few firemen on the show for another mini series, the best of the bravest. But the dispute at the time was uh, basically these heavy jobs, if you will. The fire department says, well, that's not what we do. We do fires. And so Mayor LaGuardia in his exasperation thus creates, and this turned out to be a brilliant idea, the NYPD's emergency service unit. So how did the opportunity open up for you to join ESU and why did you want to be at ESU? Well, I was back in the ninth precinct after the year in narcotics and my partner at the time, uh, was Bobby Buckwood, who was taking a ride up to the 13th precinct. I said, where are we going? He says, I want to get an application for ESU. I said, really? And I said, you know, who do you know? And he mentioned the name, and I had a former CO of the 9th Precinct who was now the CO of Emergency Service. So I said, all right, get me one. It was a simple, you know, one pager. We filled it out, we sent it in. Um, they called us for some testing, and about a year later, we were called in June, in June of 1987, we were called and uh, accepted into Emergency Service. So I didn't know a lot about Emergency Service. We had a couple of guys from the 9th Precinct who, who went there, who were working at Truck One. Didn't know a lot about it. Um, it seemed like a pretty cool, right? We got the STS training down at Floyd Bennett Field. And I think the training at that time was about six weeks of training. I think the class now is about 30 weeks. Yeah, six so months. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's really um, evolved training. And, you know, once I got in there, I, I, I never looked back. You know, I, I was on the sergeant's list. If I would have gotten called, I would have taken the, the job, of course, promotion. But, you know, my heart was an emergency. I, you know, I, I love being in one truck. Every day was something new. Every day was something different. Um, I met some of the greatest people that you could imagine in that unit. So um, absolutely no regrets. 
I think the, the interesting thing about ESU is that if you have any fears at all, like a fear of heights or a fear of certain kinds of animals, well, then those fears just pretty much in that unit, they die. Because with a city like New York, in which every and any emergency can be thrown your way, you could be going up to the top of the Brooklyn Bridge to talk somebody down from making the awful decision to commit suicide. You could be serving a warrant where there's a snake in the house. You know, we've seen plenty of that. Or a zoo animal gets loose. Of course, there's the car accidents too. And we just saw the flooding here in, in the tri-state area and the great job that ESU did in responding to that. So for you, I mean, you talk about the training having evolved from six weeks in the academy then to six months now. Uh, what is it that you enjoyed about ESU that you found to be the most challenging? Repelling, warrants, take me through it. I enjoyed diving. When, um, when, when, I, when we graduated, ESU was just developing a dive program. And when I took the swim test, and I was always a runner. I could run five, 10 miles. I was fairly in good shape. And I always enjoyed the water. When I took the swim test, I didn't pass it. It was very, uh, very disheartening, to say the least. So I went, and I went to the Y, and I took lessons. And it was actually a college course. And, you know, there were a couple of classes that I missed. And I remember one day the professor telling me, if I miss one more class, he's failing. And I said, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, aren't you a student at CSI? And I said, no, I'm not taking this class because I want to be, I want to, you know, take a scuba class. And I told him, he says, oh, my God, I didn't realize that. He said, well, whatever you do, you stick with me and we'll get through this class. And I did. And I, paid, and I went back and I took the swim test. And I eventually went on to become a, an assistant scuba instructor with the NYPD. I was probably, you know, assisted in, you know, 200 ESU officers probably came through the classes that I participated in. So I went from a, an instructor to a rescue diver to a dive master to an assistant instructor. So I, I, scuba to me, um, you know, I know it's not for everybody. The water is dark, the water is dirty. Um, most of the time the water is cold. You really can't see what you're doing. But when you know what you're doing and you have that confidence, you have that confidence in you know, that person on the, other side, on the other side of that line, when you get in that water, everybody's looking at you. When you come out of that water, and if you're fortunate enough to have made a recovery or in better a rescue, um, there's really no greater feeling than that. We all like locking up the bad guys, but the, the one job that I enjoyed the most in the issue was uh, water rescue and scuba diving. I think I can't remember the ECOP that said this, but it's true. And I imagine that's why so many of you guys are in ESU is that in ESU, I mean, yeah, uh, so often in other units, you're going out and arresting bad people. And that's good. You know, don't get me wrong. It's very important to keep the city safe and orderly. But in ESU, you get to save people. You get to uh, come to them in their darkest hour. You're not locking them up. I mean, in most situations, you're bringing them out and you're getting them the help they needed, you know, getting them to an ambulance. So you're helping them live another day. So I guess that's, you know, obviously, as you just summed it up, uh, the beauty of it. So let's expand real quick on what you mentioned in regards to diving, because I was going to ask you about that. I mean, for example, the Hudson River, there's so many jokes about if you if you swim in the Hudson River, you know, you're going to basically pick up some uh, radiological stuff and, and become some sort of species. I've seen plenty of those jokes fly around on social media because of just how you just what we said, the water is so dirty and it's got so much stuff on it. It's, it's sad, unfortunately, that people taint it. But nonetheless, when you're diving in there, for whatever reason, somebody jumped in or somebody fell in by accident. Uh, and you're diving through that murky, murky environment, what's key to staying in control to make sure that you don't jeopardize the rescue and you also don't, by extension, jeopardize yourself? Well, what I used to teach, I would teach the guys that to go in there expecting zero visibility. Don't expect to be able to see anything. And, and if you have an opportunity where you can get you know, six inches or a foot of visibility, then that's a win-win. You're on the other side, other side of a line. You have a tender. Your, your tender knows what he's doing. All you have to do is get to the bottom. You're going to be on that line, and you're going to swing out, and you're going to feel. And when you find something or somebody, you will, you know, bring that person to the surface. When we train, we train on very small items. So when you can find something, you know, like like the size of a doll or, or a doll's arm. You know, it, it gives you that 
it's kind of a sense that you can find something larger like a person, right? And, and that's really what ESU diving was. It, it was really rescue diving. When it became a recovery, it became a um, scuba team's responsibility. And, you know, there are no better divers in New York City than the scuba team. You know, that's what they do and they, they're, they're the best at it. Um, but for us, when I would teach it, I said, you know, just don't expect to see anything. There's really nothing to see down there. I've dove in the Rockaways for kids where I've had, you know, 10, 15 feet of visibility. I've dove in the East River where I've had, you know, by the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, to see fish swimming around. In the Hudson River, you don't really get that. You know, so you, the Hudson River tends to be dark all the time. But if you expect zero, and whatever you get after that is just uh, a bonus. Now, we're going to take it back to 1991, because on the treasure trove that is YouTube, the TV show Cops featured the NYPD. And one Ken Winkler makes an appearance in uh, one of the episodes. So let's take it back to 1991. Take me through what was happening on that particular night. I mean, you kind of described it there, but that's uh, one heck of a throwback. So, uh, yeah, that's why my hair was long and my shorts were short, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was one of one of many water rescues that um, you know ESU has been involved in, particularly in Manhattan. You know, it was just gentleman in the water. He was, did say he was looking for oil. Aviation came in, dropped down a, a, a ring buoy to him. He kept swimming away from it. You know, we always in when the water. We you know we 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 utilize our dry suits. We utilize a life jacket, and we have a line. Well, we kind of were out swimming our line, so we had to put two lines together. Eventually, when I got to him, he he resisted a little bit, but you know we we were able to take the fight out of him, bring him back to shore, and, and get him the help that he needed. That's good. You know, hopefully he found his oil eventually. If not in the Hudson River, then yeah. somewhere. <laughs> yeah. we, we, it's, it's funny, you know, with the first water job I ever had, there was a guy at the pier at 34th Street Heliport, and he had a company who was sitting there drinking the water. Oh, my God. Well, if, well, in a city of 8 million people, you're bound to get quite a few uh, yes, interesting characters, you know, yes, interesting characters. Say this. So I always ask this to every E-man and every FDNY guy, again, you know, particularly the guys that work in rescue, you know, I imagine now the relationship is, is cordial, which is good. You need that. And we saw a great rescue, which they teamed up and, and rescued somebody recently out of a uh, water well. He fell down a storm train and YPD, SU, FDNY rescue, just went in there and got that man out, got it to safety, thank God. But back in the 80s and early 90s, uh, NYPD ESU versus the FDNY rescue units, uh, and you're working in Manhattan in Rescue One, uh, right there sharing turf with them. It was a hot rivalry. So, uh, from your angle, you know, take me through your interactions with the guys in Rescue One. Well, you know, it, it's no different than Army Navy, right? Everybody wants to, you know, everybody, and it's Manhattan, and you're dealing with a lot of eight personalities, a lot of adrenaline junkies. And everybody has the best of intentions and we work together when we have to work together. But everybody wants to be that guy um, who makes that, who affects that rescue. That's why we're there. That's why they're in rescue. That's why they we're in the issue, right? You know, it's, it's what we do. We're not there to stand on the sidelines. We're not, the tape doesn't mean anything to us. When they put up the caution tape, that's for everybody else. That's not for us. Um, my brother was a fireman. Um, my father-in-law, brother-in-law, were fireman. My brother-in-law passed away from you know 9/11 related illness. Um, my wife is a retired detective, so you know we 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 all get along. Um, I was in Oklahoma City. Um, half of our team was made up of people from rescue or from the squad. You know we got along fine, um, but you know personalities are personalities. But in the end, 
we're just all striving for one thing, and that's to you know to save a life. Paul Hassig, who I'm sure you have plenty plenty of interactions with, has been on this show. He's a friend of mine, and and he what I what he I found what he said interesting on a couple of levels. He said one, anybody that's in a rescue rescue unit in the FDNY or special operations for the police department is relatively, as you just alluded to, the same person. They want to do good. It's not necessarily an ego thing. It's just you want to help people, which is why you're there. And you, as you said, you want to be the person to affect that rescue and, and change that person's life for the better and get them out of that situation, whatever the situation may be. And he talked about it to where, as you just said, at the end of a job, even though they'd be glaring at each other on the way to it, by the end, they're laughing and hugging. And so uh, you went down to Oklahoma City, as you just said. Um, and so I, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but in the event that you'd like to share your experiences down there, um, Take, take me through responding to the aftermath of such a horrendous tragedy two years after New York City was attacked with the first attack in the Trade Center in 93. Exactly. So in 93, you know, we had the, we had the, the first attack. I was home. You know, this is all pre-24 hour news coverage, pre-cell phone. My wife just got back from Florida. My wife was out shopping, waited for her to come home. You know a lot about it. You know, got, got to see oh, here's some ESU guys that are repelled onto the roof. Went in. The whole job was kind of over in about 30 days, you know, more or less. A lot of it was, was contained within um, when Oklahoma City happened. I remember seeing that on the news. Again, I have been taking my daughter to swim lessons, came home, went to bed, the phone rang about 10 o'clock saying we'd be de- we're being deployed. Can you go? So I looked at my wife. She says, go. So I grabbed my gear, went to Floyd Bennett Field. We started loading up our cash. This was the first um, real deployment that's as a New York task force, New York task force one. So we loaded up our gear, we got on the ground, I'm gonna say two, three o'clock in the afternoon. First thing we did was find a location that we could uh, work out of near the site. We were cleaning out, I think it was like a church or a school, a lot of broken glass. And then they came and they said, no, we have a spot back, there's a stadium, an arena, we're gonna use the arena. We went back, we got our gear, we formed up teams, we started working that evening. We had the 7 p.m. shift to 7 a.m. shift. We were very closely with the team from uh, Virginia Beach. I think the other teams that were on site were from California. So you had two teams working 7 at night to 7 in the morning, and the two teams working 7 in the morning to 7 at night. We worked closely with uh, local fire department, Oklahoma City, firefighters from Tulsa. Um, one of the things that really always stuck out was the how friendly people were. I remember when we were cleaning out that, that that church, the car pulled up and you know they had you know pans full of chicken and and, and Gatorade and you know us being from New York, we're always a little suspect when somebody was offering you food or somebody was offering you something for free. Um, I can tell you after '93, you know some of the stores around. The World Trade Center actually raised their prices. Um, and now you're out here and, and, you know, you're in Oklahoma City first time, you know, you don't know a lot about Oklahoma City. You know, I refer to it as the buckle in the belt, you know, the buckle in the Bible belt. But the, the, the genuine, um, the generosity that these people were showing was, was incredible, right? And we didn't ask for any of that. We were treated, we were treated very well. And the Muir building was a location that everybody had something to do with. Either you had some type of business in there, you worked in there. You know, it was a very central um, location for a lot of folks in Oklahoma City. So it really hit them hard, um, it really did. So I, I, when, I, when I left there, you know, I still feel um, a connection with Oklahoma City. We did a training exercise here for the company I work for now, Ports America, a safety training exercise. And we actually hosted in Oklahoma City and we did a road trip uh, to the memorial. We went to the museum, went to the memorial. And to be honest with you, some people in the group couldn't understand why we were in Oklahoma City until we got there. The memorial is wonderful. Um, I know they work closely with the 9 11 memorial. Um, it's it's something that everybody should see if they're if they're out in that part of the country, but that the people out there um, they really were a great bunch of people. 
Nomenclature guest here in the Mike Damon podcast. This is episode 101, volume two of the miniseries, The Men Inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit. Um, I asked this of Paul Hassig when he was on, and you mentioned search team, uh, search and rescue team one. So I want to ask you this too. Uh, I'm Dominican, half Dominican, half Puerto Rican. So Hurricane George hit the DR in 1998. Uh, were you among the team that went down there to help out? And if you were, tell me about your personal experiences. No, I wasn't. Uh, my, my only deployment was Oklahoma City. We tried to rotate the deployments. I know, um, we, I know we had teams in Atlanta for the Olympics. And we, we, we'd, we'd sent teams to Puerto Rico. I don't know if that team that went to the DR was actually New York Task Force One or if there was just because New York Task Force One is a FEMA team. And I don't think we deploy outside of the United States, but I think New York City sent a mutual aid team. I know that they did. They sent it to Puerto Rico, they sent it to Haiti. Um, so, for instance, in the recent hurricane in Louisiana, New York Task Force One was deployed to, um, I don't know if they were in Louisiana or Mississippi, but they were deployed down south. So there's a rotation. Uh, I think there were only maybe there were only probably 13 teams back in 95, and then they, 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 the teams grew after Oklahoma City. There's, there's quite a few more teams now. So you're on a rotation. FEMA was the baby and part of Ray Downey, the late FDNY chief, who was a very visionary guy when it came to rescue. Uh, he eventually took over the Special Operations Command uh, for the FDNY, and he lost his life saving others out on 9-11. He led the rescue efforts down in Oklahoma City in 1995, um, and of course at the World Trade Center mm. in 2001. Um, so at, at this point in the mid-90s, you have some time on the job. You know, it's, you got 15, 16 years uh, underneath your belt, um, and you have some experience, in, and of course, uh, in ESU, having close to a decade of uh, time in there. The thing that I find interesting that was mentioned to me is that whenever E-Men came in there, new E-Men, you know, one guy in particular, his name escapes me, but Lampkin mentioned them and spoke well of them. It, you know, he had had a lot of time in ESU, but nonetheless, when he saw newer guys working on newer stuff that he'd never seen, he'd never scoff at it and say, eh, what are you doing? No, he'd try to figure out what it was and how it could help it. You know, he was always looking to evolve his skill set. So how do you fight against, as you get more experience in the unit, how do you fight against the attitude of, I've seen everything, I've trained for everything, you can't show me any new tricks? I mean, if that, you know, that, that was never my attitude. Your, your attitude was every day, every day better. Um, every day you can learn something. You can learn something, like I said earlier, from anyone. You know, to think that you've seen everything is... I, I know I still to this day I've seen a lot and, and things that I can't unsee, but I have not seen everything. Um, you develop a skill set. You, you don't train to respond to a World Trade Center type event. You know, it's all those little jobs that give you that skill set to respond to that event, to an Oklahoma City, to a, a hurricane, to a nor'easter. You know, they guys are pulling people out of the basements. Um, this past weekend, and I remember back in the late '80s, you know, pulling people out of the Rockaways on a jet ski. You know, well, when Sandy hit a couple of days after Sandy, I received a phone call that a good friend of mine was missing. So I grabbed my gear, I went down to his house. His windows were boarded up, but we were able to remove the, some of the window, uh, the wood. I went into his basement and I found him. He drowned in his basement. Three people drowned on his block. So it, it, it never really leaves you. Um, but anybody who feels that they've seen everything and can't learn anything, you know, I, I think they're probably their mind is made up that you know they're just they're just there for the paycheck. And that's really not a place to be an emergency service. Right. And I'm glad that, you know, you didn't have that attitude because, you know, that's, that's the thing I wonder when, when you have somebody that has 20 years, 30 years, even 40 years of experience. Um, I wonder what their mentality is at that point uh, when they've had, you know, they've seen so much. Some things, as you said, you can't unsee. And so speaking of that, of course, that segues into the morning of September 11th, 2001, the night prior, you and Scott Strauss were working together. Scott went home, uh, but you stayed behind. 
and you take me through what happened the rest of the way. So I was doing, I used to study four to 12. So my wife was on a job. She was a detective. She was a homicide detective on Staten Island. So we had three young children. So we would, you know, we would try to work ops as much as possible um, just to be able to watch the kids. So we were both scheduled to do a four to 12 on the 11th. So I changed my tour to a midnight. The plan was, you know, I would go home. It was the first full day of school. The kids would go to spring school. Easy day, pick them up from school. We wouldn't need any uh, any babysitters. She had called me up that evening and said that she's had her tour changed because she had to go to federal court in Manhattan. So I said, I'm not going to change it back. Just leave it the way it is. So I did the 4 to 12 on the 10th into the midnight. It was a relatively quiet night, not much happening. Um, we had a new piece of equipment. I think it was a, a window cutter that you use for high rises. Uh, Brian McDonald was there. We took the stuff out, you know, had a cup of coffee. Under normal circumstances, after working 16 hours after midnight, you know, you'd rush home and go to bed. But like I said, it was, it was a relatively quiet night. I'd been inside that night. So um, it wasn't, I wasn't that tired, let's put it that way. And I was going down to get my keys when the job came over the radio, came over the last week of a plan at the World Trade Center. Brian came running down and said, did you hear that? I said, yeah, man, I'm grabbing my stuff. But my locker was near the truck. I grabbed my gear. Guys came down, and I'm like, and Larry, Cliff Allen was a chauffeur, a signed chauffeur for the day tour. Um, and I jumped in the back of the truck, big truck, truck one. On the way down there, I realized that I grabbed everything but pants. I was just wearing shorts. So I got on the intercom, I told the Sarge, I don't, really have, I don't have pants. She said, I don't worry about it, you're not gonna need it. Didn't really, I still not um, knowing that it was a commercial airliner. So when we got down to the site, there aren't any windows in the back of the truck, so we really couldn't see them until I got down there. We walked on church and Bessie, and um, I became the truck one chauffeur, right? And Don, I said, you'd be the chauffeur. And basically what that means is you're running the mobilization point for the issue. You're going to operate two radios. You're going to operate on a citywide frequency. You're going to operate on a point to point frequency. You're going to have all the units responding units report to you. They'll be directed uh, you know, as needed. Uh, team one, which was um, Lieutenant Holyfield, who happened to be on the scene when it happened, was going to court. Him, I saw his name, Larry Cliff Allen, Dave Moore, and Roger Mack were team one. They were going into the building. The plan was to have everybody kind of respond to me. I knew in 93 that, you know, some people had climbed those stairs twice, that there was a lot of ad hoc response, you know, a, little, a lot of freelancing going on. We learned in Oklahoma City of having a more structured response. And we, we took on that model. Um, we mobilized better. I believe it was when Chief Anamone was chief that he's the one who started these mobilizations. And while they were a pain in the neck, they saved many lives on 9-11. So the mobilization point for issue was church investing. The plan was, I knew there were three stairwells that we had to get into, three teams equally outfitted, get to those who needed us the most. We'd have additional trucks respond to me. We'd start stripping the trucks, set up the cash of equipment. And then once those guys got to a certain point in, in the North Tower, they would radio to me at whatever they needed, whether it was hearse tools, cutting tools, airbags, whatever it might be, and somebody else would bring that up to them. And that was the plan. I thought it was a, a good plan. Um, we also put people on the helicopters. I didn't know at the time that we actually had people on the helicopter responding from Floyd Meadow Field, but my goal was to have a team on a helicopter here. Um, I didn't know, none of us knew that there was an access to the roof. Um, there was a radio transmission that nobody was to propel onto the roof from a deputy commissioner. But in my opinion, and it's still my opinion, that that's not his call, that it's the call of the pilot and the repel team, that they have that ability. That's them to make that decision. That's what they're paid for. That's what they're trained to do. You know, there's this notion of running jobs from your car uh, is something that never really sat well with us. I always felt that if you want to run a job, you need to be on the scene. Um, so I was the senior ESU officer at the time. 
and I became a truck one chauffeur. There is a video, it's brief, and I want to ask if this is you guys of uh, some of the ESU trucks responding. Uh, this is after the first plane hit. You can tell me if this is you guys or not. Hold on just one moment while I pull it up. Is that yeah, true? I think that was truck one. I, mean, I couldn't see the beginning where it, it, it looked like us. Um, I'm not sure, but it looked like us. We, we, that's where we came. Out. We came in through uh, right off of Vesky Street there, right off the church. So you talked earlier about how nothing, you know, you don't train for this type of an event. I mean, even for someone like yourself that had 20 years of experience by this point, was a detective by this point, had been in ESU for a long time, 14 years, you're the most senior guy in the entire unit. So as you're staring up at this horrendous scene, the shocking scene that is like straight out of a movie, uh, what's going through your mind? Well, I was a senior person on, on the scene. I wasn't the senior person in the unit, but I was, you know, and, and you know, that's when something meant being a senior guy in emergency meant something. You know, you didn't have to have bosses tell you what to do. It was the senior guy in emergency a lot of times to make that decision. Um, it was, you know, it was a job. You know, we had a job in front of us. We had we had a very difficult task in front of us. Um, I gave these guys their assignments. They came to me um, when the South Tower was hit. I didn't know it was a plane. I just saw the debris field kind of raining down around us. I radioed that information to the teams that are in the North Tower and it was like, you know, basically, okay, just do what you have to do. And then, you know, we, we just started doing the same thing in the South Tower, putting teams together and sending them in to get into the stairwells to get to the people that needed us the most. I wasn't expecting this job to end in a few hours or a few days or a few weeks. I knew it was going to be a uh, a long time before we were done, before we were in 1998. I expected collapses at or above the impact zone. Um, you know, there was a concern of secondary attacks. There was a second mobilization point set up on Church and Vesey. We had our apprehension team there when uh, Sergeant Curtin and uh, John DeLauer responded from the Q-Truck. You know, Sergeant Curtin had his vest on tactical vest and he has mp5 with him and um john was was taking some airbag to off the truck and i looked at both of them and i said no we're not going tactical here you know this is we have other people that are going to do that so kurt he took off his vest but he kept his mp5 with him um when we recovered mike saw his mp5 on him but you know their team went in and you know, they affected rescues of those folks that were um injured as a result of the South Tower collapsing. And the teams in the South Tower, um, you know, the collapse was so catastrophic. Um, there really wasn't a high probability of survival. There was hope. You know, there were voids. I was in voids. But that, that, that collapse, that pancake type collapse of 110 story buildings is not a very survivable event but nonetheless um we had hope we had hope right so when you look at it you don't get overwhelmed by it when you're in the middle of something you just deal with it you forget about what's happening around you and then at some point during the day you know things kind of set in you start you know like was my wife down there it's because if she was at a federal court she would only been two blocks away again we really didn't have cell phones then. We had one cell phone between us, and it was in the glove compartment of the car. There was really no way to communicate with anybody. Um, you know, another issue side came up to me and told me he had seen my brother. Yeah, my brother was, he was parked on church. He was a chauffeur for his engine company, and he was parked on church when the South Tower collapsed. He was kind of trapped under his truck, and then he made it to the North, and the North Tower collapsed, and he ended up making it over to the fireboat. You know, so you're wondering where you, you know, at some point you're wondering where your kids are. You, you don't, you know, you're not aware of a plane crash into a Pentagon or 
the plane crashing in Shanksville. You, you, you just kind of focused on, on, on the task in front of you. And at the time, you know, we maintained uh, that mobilization point. It was the only mobilization point that um, basically stood throughout the two collapses. And one of the things that was cited in the 9-11 Commission report was um, NYPD and, and ESU's command and control structure and their communications by everybody being on the right channel, it, um, it, it led to a lot of people making it out of that building. So, you know, that, that just goes back to training. When these guys were assigned to their teams, you, there was no questioning it. You know, these guys were gonna go in if somebody would have came up to me and said, hey, those buildings are going to collapse, I would have radioed that into those teams. They would have been like, okay, you know, they would just move real fast. Even when I called for the evacuation of the North Tower, if the South Tower collapsed, the guys from Team 1 and 2, they didn't, they didn't understand the magnitude. You know, they were inside of a building where each floor was an acre, you know, unless you were looking out a window. You know, they felt some shaking, but they didn't realize that you know, the entire South Tower was gone. Talking with Ken Winkler here on the Mike Tim podcast. You know, Kevin Barry, uh, who's a friend of mine, uh, he's one of the bomb squad guys I had on, and, and um, he was an ESU prior to going to the bomb squad. He told me, you know, when he got down there, he locked eyes with John Delara, and that they kind of just rolled, you know, they kind of looked up and said, you know, we don't know what we're getting into. Right. And that, that was the last time that Kevin ever saw John. John was in the lobby of Six Floor Trade with Mike Curtin and Dan Richards uh, from the bomb squad. Mm -hmm. they, they were killed when the North Tower fell. And, and at this point, I mean, we'll talk about that evacuation order right now because uh, you have your teams in there. There's one team, is, there's a couple teams in the North Tower, and one of them is led by Sergeant Curtin, um, who's got some guys with him, and Joe Vigiano also being among those guys. And then you have you have in the teams in the other South Tower, uh, other tower, I should say, it's being the South Tower, uh, led by Sergeant Rod Gillis and his guys, um, and Sergeant John Coglin and his guys. Um, among them, Steve Driscoll, Paul Talty, Ronnie Klopfer, Molly Weaver, Jerome Dominguez, um, Santos Valentin. So you watch this collapse happen. You have to run for cover, obviously, to survive in your own right. But a lot of people have credited you with when you came over the radio to tell them to evacuate with saving their lives. So, you know, to, to have the wherewithal after this enormous collapse and witnessing the depths of so many people in that terrifying instant um, to even get on the radio and say, hey, get out of the North Tower. I guess focus and, and, and zone in on that moment, if you will, which obviously helped the number of cops from the NYPD lost that day not be higher. Well, you know, prior to the South Tower collapsing, I was um, I had a list of everybody, who they were and where they were going. And, um, there's another ESU officer who happened to go off duty the lunch who came by. He happened to be working in the area. And I happened to look over my shoulder and, and I saw an officer that was supposed to be on Sergeant Kyle's team, Wilson McCormick. And he was kind of walking back. And they, and they had left, you know, some time before that. So I started thinking to myself, you know, what, what's this piece of paper I have? I mean, are these guys not, you know, who they're supposed to be with and where they're supposed to be? So um, McCormick basically said that um, Sergeant Cogman had sent him back for a piece of equipment. Um, McCormick's father was killed in the line of before I was in, he was in the issue officer, he was before I came into the unit. I think Sergeant Cogman sent him back because he knew he was prepared. Yeah. He didn't, you know, it was bad enough that, you know, um, his mother lost her husband that he didn't learn if he was his son as well. So I had told McCormick to, to stay with me and I would put him on another team. And probably less than five minutes or so, the South Tower collapsed. So, um, you know, that was that divine intervention. Was that John Coughlin uh, just knowing how bad it was could be and looking out for him? I don't know. I knew John. I knew all these guys. You know, we... We worked together, we trained together, we socialized together, we laughed together. We were a small unit. So 
it certainly saved his life. There were other um, officers from task force that were going into the building that were redirected out by our CEO at the time, Inspector Watson. So it was important that we maintain control. Um, when the South Tower collapsed, you know, my job was to get the guys out of the North Tower, to radio them. We went from a clear day to, to you know, basically from gray to dark gray to black, and then back to gray. Um, I was behind the truck on the radio, you know, trying to work off of two radios. They did have the transmissions when Sergeant Kernison was asking for assistance. I was in the process of directing Sergeant so Mendel Larry's team to them. We had a team that was trapped, uh, Lieutenant Murphy's team that was trapped between the North and the South Tower. We had a team that was on our way to the uh, to aviation to where they were going to meet over by North Cold, kind of by Cyrus and High School to pick up the helicopter. So, um, and Sergeant Curtin radioed that whatever the person that they would deal, handle when they were aiding, but they didn't need any further assistance. So that's when we directed team one out. Uh, I believe I was in Oklahoma City with Sergeant Curtin. I knew him. He was a former Marine. I, I, I feel that he didn't have his whole team with him. There was some separation. And that's why he sent some of his team to go search the customs house, Mark and Marco and some other folks while he waited. Um, and then the North Tower had collapsed. We found Officer Perry, that's the officer who had retired and you know, kind of hit the shield on the back. And we found Officer Perry and we recovered Officer Perry um, it was a ceremonial procession up the ramp and, and the late flow was there and we kind of concentrated in that same spot. The next pick with the, with the machine was my curtain. We were actually standing on my curtain while we were recovering the curry. When we found Vinnie Dan's, Vinnie Dan was up against one of the walls where there was a, where the big windows were in the trade center laying next to uh, the tower. But he was in the debris field in the South Tower. So I, I, I think that, you know, Sergeant Curtin was waiting for his whole team. And for some reason, you know, they, they, they were separated. Um, and that's why they, they didn't make it out. Sergeant Curtin was not going to leave anybody behind. You know, that was in his nature, that was in his training. Um, we did not know that. Um, Perry was with him. Um, I, I, don't know if I didn't even know who was with him other than the guys that I assigned to that team. Um, so after the South Tower collapsed, I remember when we had to move up towards the Woolworth building. And that, by that time, a lot of the ESU officers that were at home or off duty started arriving. And we just had to start forming up teams again. To go back in. The biggest challenge was we didn't have good communication. We didn't have enough radios for every single officer. So you'd have a team of eight people with one radio. But we probably went, we then went back onto the pile and started looking. Uh, we ended up going south and setting up a command post down by Liberty Street. Uh, and that's where we were hoping to find somebody. We were constantly asking, calling names over the radios, calling the roll calls over the radios. And hoping that somebody would answer, even the guys from Team One. You know, it took them a long time before they answered their radios. So that's what we were doing. Um, you know, we, we, we had to get right back into it. Um, you know, we received a transmission a little later that evening from the Port Authority offices that were alive or trapped. Patty Strauss, Patty McGee, Timmy Adra, a bunch of other guys. And uh, I'm sure I'm leaving people out and I apologize for that. We work closely to get the supplies to them to bring um, the two port authorities out. Uh, we were the first one that came out. And then I was relieved. And the next morning, they, they, they took out Sergeant McCartney. That was uh, an amazing rescue that, that uh, you and, and Scott Strauss were able to assist. And I didn't know John Perry was with uh, Sergeant Curtin. I know that it was an eight-man team of two, consisting of two Port Authority police officers, Bill Bury 
uh, Mark DeMarco, Sergeant Curtin, John DeLara, and, uh, and Dan McNally and, and uh, Danny Richards from the bomb squad. Um, we're, in the, we're in the customs house searching for people when the North Tower gave way. Um, you know, and obviously for those of you that, that watched my episode with John Lampkin, he took us through the rescue of Sergeant uh, McLaughlin and Officer Jimeno. It's a great story. Um, go back and watch that if you haven't, so you can hear that particular part. Now you're faced with the task, uh, and, and uh, we'll hit on a few more things. I, I thank you for your time and for being here. Now you're faced with the task of trying to rebuild this unit. It, it, 23 officers from the NYPD lost their lives that day. 14 of them were E-men. So now you can't replace these individuals. You never will. But in that experience, that heroism, and just the good people they were is irreplaceable. But as far as making sure the ranks were filled up to a healthy level again, you stayed. And you know, obviously you had to help with that for a year before you retired in 2002. Um, how many people were volunteering to come into ESU? Not in a negative, oh, this is my chance type of way, which is a horrible way to look at it, but rather just, I want to help these guys out, that camaraderie amongst your police brethren. Uh, take me through rebuilding ESU and the willingness of those to help you rebuild ESU. Well, just about everybody who was retired and who could help did. You know, people come from all over, they would either be out of flood better field where they would come to the site. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of things going on. You know, most difficult, um, you know, all the losses are, were terrible, but for, for me, you know, Brian, you know, Brian McDonald, he was the newest guy in the truck, right? Brian should have been on team one. Brian was waiting for a tall fly guy, somebody from another truck, because we were a little short. So Brian got there, you know, after the, the, the one truck guys were already in. Uh, I remember Brian assisting a civilian and you know, telling Brian, that, hey, you know what, we just, we just got a triage in here because there's a lot of people that are a lot worse. But Brian, you know, I understood got his gear and, and Ryan was placed on a team that went to the South Tower. Um, and you know, I I wish he was back there with the rest of us, right? But he didn't. And you know, Ryan was somebody who wanted to be in the issue, wanted to be in the NYPD cop, wanted to be in the man his whole life. So uh, that, that's probably one of the more difficult you know, losses for me personally. Um, but as far as rebuilding the unit, you know, we had a lot going on, right? We worked 12 hour shifts. We basically had two days off a month. We were dealing with a uh, big counter, not only dealing with the site, but we, you know, we, there was a big counterterrorism um, detail, whether it was the mayor or counter assault to the mayor or um, the president flying in. It wasn't too long after the first threat of the attacks that we were dealing with the anthrax jobs, where, you know, to pull them back to what we spoke to earlier, there would be two ESU uh, officers and, and two firemen from Special Operations Command that would respond to all white powder jobs throughout the city. Um, and then you had no patrol, right? You had patrol, you had people that got stuck in elevators or you had perps, you had EDPs, you know, so you had a lot going on. Um, and yeah, it was at the time, you know, whatever you needed, you got, you know, um, equipment wise. We lost a lot of vehicles, uh, a lot of equipment was destroyed. Um, and so, you know, we were, we were getting what we needed. Of course, our focus was being down at, at the site and, and not just recovering, you know, the people that we lost, but recovering everybody. You know, it's still to this day, I've not recovered every single ESU officer. I'm glad that we recovered all of them on ESU officers, but there's still um, families who have not had the ability to lay their loved ones to rest. I think with time and new technology, they may you know, be able to identify uh, their names. But as far as the unit, you know, the unit was strong. The unit, you know, it was there long before I was there, like you stated earlier, and it'll be there long after I'm gone. You know, people 
there, I don't know what the number was of people looking to apply to ESU. Uh, I know this most recent class I graduated out of you know, approximately 400 applicants, 40 were accepted and 30 some are graduated. I would imagine it was the same back then. So um, we, we were used to working, you know, in small teams. So, you know, we were able to do the job. You know, the day-to-day -day job had to get done. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think looking back um, at ESU's role that day and, and, and the days afterwards, it's just, it's just that. It's, it's that uh, wonderful camaraderie to keep going. And the fact that the jobs did keep you busy um, and that you did have that opportunity to stick it out. Um, you know, I know they found some equipment of some of the guys. Rod Gillis, was, his gun was found. I believe his mother was doing an interview about that a number of years ago. His gun or his gun belt was recovered, but not him. Um, and hopefully, as we have the new technology, can provide some sort of finality to those families. Most of the 23 were recovered, but some were not. And the same is true for 343 firemen uh, as well. And, and you can't forget them. And 37 Port Authority police officers. You can't forget three court officers. Um, Keith Roma from the Fire Patrol, the AEMS, Buddy Hatton from the FBI, Craig Miller from the Secret Service, you can't forget him. And uh, people have it, which is, which is good. Um, so you retired in 2002, as I mentioned earlier. When you look back on your career, what are you most proud of? I'm really most proud of, um, you know, just always trying to do the right thing, uh, you know, helping as many people as you could help. It was, you know, it's in the title, right? It's in the title of the book, Emergency Service. And, you know, it's our middle name and we just provided a service. Um, we just did, you know, we just did the best that we could do. That's all, I, that's all I can be proud of. I just did the best I can do. It's been a great uh, conversation with you. I'm really glad that you made the time for me and that I could have you here. Um, so it is now time for a segment of this podcast called Rapid Fire. It's concluding segment five hit and run questions from me. Five yeah. answers from you. Are you ready? Sure, sure. So first, if not for the NYPD, what other career, and you kind of touched on it earlier, but what other career could you have seen yourself pursuing and enjoying? Um, I think I would have, wouldn't have mind being a, a, a crane operator. I, I always liked heights and I always kind of had an appreciation for those guys who are on top of these high rises, lifting all that heavy steel and equipment up. To borrow a line from a Faith No More song, uh, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't have a bravery for it, but shout out to those that do. Second, I know you mentioned diving was your favorite drill, but besides diving, uh, favorite drill you did in ESU? Um, aside from diving, um, teaching. I enjoyed teaching uh, the, the new ESU classes. Good. Third, most uplifting job you ever responded to? We were driving back one night along... Um, I guess it was First Avenue and it was a car in front of us and they, they stopped the car very quickly and a woman came out with the baby and the baby wasn't breathing, the baby was blue. And I was working with the fly guy from Six Truck Company, you could stand there. So we immediately grabbed the first aid kit. And in the first aid kit, we actually had something, it was actually, believe it or not, a turkey baster. Um, and we were able to suction the obstruction out from the baby and the baby started breathing again and we had to get the baby to the hospital and the baby survived. Wow, it's amazing. Fourth, favorite bar or restaurant in New York City? I've been working up on the West Side, so I would say uh, there's probably two of them, Landmark and maybe McQuaid. There are a couple of old longshoremen bars. They've been around here forever. They have a lot of history with the West Side and the, and the waterfront. Okay, fifth and finally, what advice would you give anyone coming on the job now? Well, you know, I, I know I know it's hard, but I, I, I would like you to keep your head out of your phone, and that, that's challenging because there's so much information that within the police department internally that's transmitted via your phone. But you know, I, I, I quite often I see you know teams, partners, radio cars, or, or cops standing on the corner, and everybody's got their head in their phone, and nobody's looking up. Um, you got to have your head on a swivel nowadays. That concludes what's been a very good episode of the Mike Game Podcast. Of course, it's the guests that make the show good. It's not really anything that I do. Um, I'm honored that I get the chance to chat with such uh, great people. And Ken was certainly no different for episode 101. So uh, is there any plugs or shout outs that you'd like to give? 
Nope, I just, um, you know, we're coming up on that 20th anniversary uh, of 9-11, uh, as everybody knows, and I think I would wish we could just go back to the, not go back, I wish I'd go back to September 10th of 2001, but um, there are a few guys that are still in the command, that are still working, that were there when I was there, and, you know, those, those are the real heroes, those are the guys that have lived, have worked through all of the changes, and, um, if they have an opportunity, um, you should bring them on board, and they probably can't because they're still working. But anybody has an opportunity to share the story, to share the story of not just the 14 emergency service officers, but the other officers that we lost on that day. Um, just one, I'd like to just mention Moira Smith. Moira was a cop in the 13th. I knew more of a sister. We kind of hung around together. She was a little younger than I was. We would go on camping trips, getting on trips, et cetera. She hung out with her friends. And, and so when, um, you know, I would see more in a precinct and everything, uh, you know, it was kind of nice. You know, she's a little younger than we were. But you, know, you want to talk about bravery. You want to talk about somebody who was in and then who was out. You know, when you look at those nine officers aside from emergency service, outside of emergency service, they didn't have the training that we had. But, you know, they, they still went in, they went to serve, they went to help people. Um, and, and, and look at those that, that the survivors of, of the teams, you know, of Mark and Marco and, you know, and, and the teams from truck one that were able to get out and go back in and continue looking for victims. So it's not a shout out, but I just think it maybe it's a call out that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who did a lot of, amazing things you know they're, they're very quiet and very um they keep to themselves they don't really share and I, I appreciate you sharing that obviously morris smith was the only female nypd officer who died that day and it's not just her it's her partner bobby fazio they both yep. uh went down there and, and helped out john perry as you mentioned earlier was at one pp retiring when he heard what was going on uh and he raced down there jimmy lee here in the sixth precinct he didn't have to be there uh right. but he went up there uh, to help out anyway, of course, Tim Roy from the bus unit, can't forget him. And uh, if you go and you watch my bomb squad interviews, I mentioned them a lot. Uh, Dan Richards from the bomb squad, you know, you can't forget about Danny and what he did that day. So um, on my end, uh, per usual for the audience, if you want to connect with me, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mike in New Haven. You can find me on Instagram at original underscore MC1. You can find me on LinkedIn, Mike Cologne, just type in MIC apostrophe D uh, to connect with me. On that front, if you want to uh, see, see what I'm up to, see my work, see the guests that I have coming up on the show, it's all there. And of course, if you want to email me for any sports related guests or inquiries for the show, I do sports too. Uh, hit me up, cologne on sports at gmail.com, C O L O N on sports at gmail.com, or call me up at the sports business line, 917 727 0891. Any other inquiry that you may have for the show, news, fire service, law enforcement, and whatnot, you can email me, cologne report, T H E C O L O N report at gmail.com again the cologne report at gmail.com or call me at 917-781-6189 i'm trying to lock it down uh, but next week should be a couple of interesting shows uh, nancy Rommelman, writer and an author will be joining me uh september 13th uh, she is really just a reporter that loves to get down in the trenches so I'm trying to lock in with her hopefully she confirms and she should be on the 13th and uh, the 14th is the continuation hopefully as well if i can confirm it of the mini series the best of the bravest interviews with the fdny's elite Joe Kanaski, retired Rescue One fireman, will hopefully join me Tuesday, September 14th. So thank you for watching episode 101. On behalf of retired NYPD detective Ken Winkler, this has been volume two of the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit. We will see you next time. Take care, everyone. <laughs>